Good morning, distinguished uh, participants, and uh, good morning or afternoon as well to colleagues uh, and friends who couldn't make it but are uh, with us online because, as you know, this is uh, online. So you are not the only one uh, who wished to come to Thailand and couldn't make it. Um, my daughters also wanted to come to Thailand with me, but for another reason. They are a big fan of uh, Thai cuisine. So, uh, my name is Osman Dian, and I'm the Senior Immunization Advisor at GSI. And I have the privilege today to have uh, my old friend and mentor as the rapporteur, Modi Bodiko. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have Yafsa uh, Nelson from GSI, who later will moderate the QA. Uh, uh, you let you know that uh, people have been for months putting work for this session today with the time. We work together and we really thank you Ryan for the good work we have done so far. And thanks also to Patrick uh, and the organizing committee for setting up all this. So I think you all have the brochure and the agenda. And uh, this morning session, This morning's session is about the component to consider when designing the supply chain. It covers two topics, supply chain design and optimization, and vaccine management. Uh, similarly to other days, we have two global updates, followed by country presentations. And uh, as you all see in the agenda for the afternoon, we have interactive sessions. So please note that uh, the, these interactive sessions are designed on purpose so that we can deeper discuss and have uh, more focused discussions. Uh, to reach our objective in this morning, uh, I will invite all participants to agree on few, few, few rules so, uh, so that we can keep everything on time and at the same time get the most out of the session. The rules I'm proposing are for participants, avoid as much as possible side discussions, have your telephone on mode mute or off if possible, raise your hand and tap when you want to intervene. And when speaking, do not give another presentation, please. Yeah, <laughs> be brief and concise. So, two speakers, uh, you have 15 minutes. I think it's not like that. So, uh, a yellow card will be shown by Kirsten just in front of you to let you know you have five minutes left. And the red card will be shown two minutes before for you to wrap up. So, Kirsten, you can show me my yellow card. Sorry. As I said, uh, today's session is a system design, meaning how we can bring immunization, logistics, and the cold chain into a more modern world. We should think outside of the long existing conventional method models and find more sophisticated, creative, and effective ways to use the data and technology that we have nowadays. We are in 2015, we are not in 2015 years ago when I started logistics at AFLO, so there is a lot of things that have changed. To successfully achieve this objective, we need to bring together a country program, agencies, and 
industry partners and local experts to define guidance, mechanisms, and metrics in support of activities that can improve availability, potency, and efficiency of in-country distribution system. Uh, we can be innovative, eh? but we have to always remember that even though vaccines are health commodities, they are unique commodities. And immunization supply chain management, standards and practices should be maintained, but not at the expense of compromising coverage and timeliness. So this is very important to remind always, whatever we do, please let us not forget coverage and timeliness. We are not doing logistics for the sake of doing logistics, we are doing it for that. So, the first update on global efforts to strengthen vaccine management best practices will be made by Diana Shanglang, who is a program operation team manager at WHO in Geneva. And the second global update on new efforts to frame supply chain network design, development for evidence-based decision-making courses will be presented by Ryan. Uh, Ryan is a, a supply chain specialist in uh, UNICEF uh, headquarters uh, in uh, Copenhagen, supply division. As I said, these global updates will be followed by a series of uh, selected country experiences. Before coffee break, we will have Mozambique, Ethiopia, and Benin who will present, and each country will illustrate a range of approaches to supply chain design. After coffee break, we will have presentations from Thailand, Myanmar, Uganda, and Somalia that will present some challenges with immunization supply chain fundamentals. I think uh, I haven't seen the red card yet, but please, Diana, you are welcome to the floor for the first global update. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Here's some of bad news for you. I'm colorblind. Okay. This is funny because yesterday, from sitting from there, I was seeing all these gentlemen, you know, having to lean over to reach the mic, and I'm having to maybe <laughs> make sure you can see me over the flowers. So. Um, I was asked to uh, simply give an update on the types of things uh, WHO and UNICEF are doing to ensure that the basics are fixed, uh, vaccine management best practice uh, issues. So yesterday, I think Robert Steinglass showed this slide, uh, findings from the 70 countries that have conducted EBM assessments. Uh, and you see that this is the percentage of countries that have achieved the minimum standard of performance with the EBM, uh, and it's not as strong as we'd like to see. And certainly some of the core variables around temperature control, maintenance systems, distribution and transport, and stock management, you see that less than 20% actually achieve the minimum standard, the minimum standard being a performance of at least 80% or greater. So this uh, when this came forth to us, this was quite alarming. These are really the basics. This whole session today is about projecting out to the future, thinking about design, system optimization, and innovation, uh, which Raja spoke about a little bit yesterday. And those aspirations are critically important. But, Performance on a core foundation is wobbly and fragile and perhaps not sustainable. And I would make the uh, allusion to what we're trying to do with accelerated disease control. Right? So what's happening with measles uh, elimination or polio eradication and why we just can't get that last push is largely because our routine systems and EPI are still not grounded strongly enough. And I would say we risk the same things with our vision for immunization supply chain if 
for not getting the fundamentals right and strong. So I think many of you know about the EBM initiative, uh, but I just wanted to place emphasis on the fact that we've been really trying uh, to use this initiative in a more comprehensive manner. So what's happened with the 70 assessments we've seen and we've seen the flaws in the systems is that a lot of emphasis has been put on the assessment itself. It's a very thorough assessment. Any country who's been through it, I think, has lots of learnings from the assessment itself. Um, but we really need to power up the planning part of it. What you do with the findings from those recommendations to develop an institutional uh, strengthening plan or an Otherwise, we call it an improvement plan. And linking that improvement plan <clears throat> to kind of a more holistic vision for EPI. So linking that to perhaps cold chain inventories, EPI reviews, finding from the temperature monitoring assessments, et cetera. Putting that together in a strategic framework uh, that is aligned with your comprehensive multi-year plan and perhaps your health sector plan. Uh, for those countries that are GAPI eligible, how they can access funds uh, through their health system strengthening trying to put a more long-term strategic vision to how you want to strengthen your immunization supply chain. So not just addressing the recommendations that come from the assessment itself, but a broader vision for where do you want your program to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years. So the comprehensive EBM initiative is to try to place greater emphasis on step two so that a country that can shift into action and implement for change reach what we call the six rights. Robert referred to that yesterday, getting the right products and the right quantities in the right condition at the right place, time, and cost. Um, and this portion of the implementing for change we're also seeing, because we're talking a lot about system changes, these are not changes that we see that can be turned around quickly in a three-year time frame, perhaps not even a five-year time frame. It really requires a longer-term vision to put what's needed place uh, to start to see results. So if I can turn back to this idea of getting back to basics, um, I just wanted to run through some of the types of initiatives that WHO and UNICEF and its partners have tried to put in place to aid countries. Um, the EBM itself comes with a whole range of standard operating procedures. Um, I've listed them here. You see for the nine components of the EBM, there are actually very detailed SOPs that are available on the WHO website. Uh, and I would like to give a nod of acknowledgement to Andrew there in the corner, because Andrew's the one who wrote uh, the majority of these SOPs. And these give very clear protocol steps uh, with respect to uh, best practice uh, in the areas of the, the topics you see here. There is also the UNICEF cold chain support package CCSP, which provides uh, a range of commercial and technical information, it's quite detailed, uh, to enable efficient and effective procurement uh, for areas uh, related to the cold chain, be it uh, equipment or services. There's a series of eight modules that are quite complete. You can access them off the web. I've given the URL on this website as well, on this slide as well. With respect to guidance materials, periodically WHO and UNICEF generate and disseminate different technical information briefs. The one picture here is one on vaccine biomonitors. Uh, this is in relation to uh, the IPD vaccine and the pentavalent vaccine, one of the pentavalent suppliers for which a BBM7 is supplied, which is, uh, while it's a BBM7 that's been around for quite some time, it's one of the newer uh, presentations to be handled by countries. So these kind of information briefs are widely circulated. Circulated, They're posted on the WHO and UNICEF websites and they're also disseminated on the WHO website. We recently updated and revised and disseminated the multi-dose bio policy, which I think everybody in this room should be familiar with. So this was revised in 2014. The original was written in 2000 and that was also posted and disseminated through the Techno Forum. And there will be a companion document soon to be published, which is on the proper handling and use of vaccine millions. 
for those who know immunization of practice, that has also been updated, uh, and this will be issued in 2015. In the immunization of practice, there is a vaccine cold chain module. And we've also updated, uh, with the support of PATH, the, what we call the bubble chart. This was actually first designed by uh, somebody you all know well, who was standing here yesterday, John Lloyd, uh, back in 2006, presented at the 2006 TechNet meeting. And since that time, we've had a plethora of, of new vaccines raining down on us. So that bubble chart has also been updated. And that's kind of more the upstream stuff, uh, the downstream stuff to kind of help countries uh, understand a bit more the, the vaccines that they're handling. On the upstream side, we've also recently revised our uh, document called Assessing the Programmatic Suitability of Vaccine Candidates for WHO Qualifications. This is the PSPQ, we call it. And this is essentially more to work on the upstream with manufacturers to signal to manufacturers types of vaccine presentations that would be most desirable to be used in EPI. So for instance, to be able to signal to manufacturers that we would like vaccines that are in fact liquid rather than lyophilized, or that we prefer perhaps um, to have vaccines that are more thermal stable uh, and not so preferably be kept at 2 to 8 rather than negative 15, et cetera, et cetera. So this also, this is something maybe that is not seen as well in the field, it's not as visible, but it's work that goes on uh, on the upstream side to make sure the vaccines you receive uh, at the end of the line can actually be handled and managed uh, with the least challenge possible. And when we did um, the SOPs for the EBM, what we found is there were still gaps evidence gaps for one, but also kind of how-to gaps. The SOPs are very clear kind of recipe books uh, and protocol uh, procedures, uh, but what's missing is kind of the, the field implementation and the decisions that need to be made in the field. Uh, so we have uh, put together kind of a modular approach to developing uh, pieces with respect to overall vaccine management. We call it the Vaccine Management Handbook two modules coming out, one how to use passive containers and cooler packs for vaccine transport and operations. Secondly, how to monitor temperatures in the vaccine supply chain. So this is uh, more of a technical guide, perhaps provincial, regional man uh, manager level. And I think um, what we learned with the experience is that EPI, because it's gotten so complex, it can't be as dogmatic as it used to be. There's a lot more information that's needed to make uh, astute decisions. So these guides are more about providing the evidence uh, and the guidelines around which the, the country can decide what are the proper conditions to execute and put into practice different policies. So for instance, the issue of passive containers and coolant packs uh, refers for the first time of how to use cool water packs. But it doesn't dictate to a country how to use cool water packs, but it gives conditions under which WHO would recommend the safest way to use cool water packs should a country decide uh, to proceed in that manner. And these also will be published soon. They're just in the middle of being designed and should be issued and will be posted on TechNet, so please keep your eye out on the website for that. There's also e-learning activities uh, that are issued. I think many in the room are quite familiar with Kevin Kotobro. So this is on our pharmaceutical side, uh, not on the EPI side, but the where there's a whole range of uh, different videos, training videos, online videos that can be accessed that are quite um, you know, engaging, uh, very, very informative. Again, I give you the URL there, and I really encourage you if you have time. The videos are not long. They're five to 10 minutes, and we have some of our video stars actually sitting in this room, Denny Mera, uh, Sergei uh, Tiki, to uh, take a look at uh, the site at that time. And then guidance materials still under development, still to come. Uh, we're working on a manual around introducing solar-powered vaccine refrigerator and freezer systems. Uh, so this is overall working with countries as countries shift uh, from the use of kerosene and gas and make 
want to institute solar, uh, access to solar SDD, uh, direct drive units, to kind of give countries guidance on how they can do that uh, in the most effective way possible. So this will also be uh, issued soon. It's in the final stages of editing. And for the EVM handbook series, there's a range of modules that are currently under development. How to manage stocks effectively, how to forecast vaccines, how to calculate vaccine volumes and capacity, and how to develop preventive and repair maintenance systems. So these are also uh, ongoing, so you should hopefully uh, be seeing those quite soon. And in conclusion, I didn't see the yellow card, did I? Okay, good. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to say this, uh, all these things I've covered are really um, uh, huge undertakings and uh, well, a whole range of partners, even though I presented them as uh, WHO publications, I really want to uh, note that uh, it involves a whole range of skill sets um, and diverse disciplines, so uh, I want to make sure that is uh, emphasized. So in conclusion, you know, John kind of walked us through the life of the immunization supply chain yesterday, which is about four years old. Uh, we've seen that the management of the ISCL has grown increasingly complex over those past four years. That there are now concerted efforts by the partners to develop resource and guidance materials to inform decision making. Again, not to be dogmatic, but to give countries the evidence uh, and the rationale for how they will go about making choices. And all this in order to help countries to consolidate the essentials, to get the foundation firm, in order to put them in a good position to be able to innovate sustainably. And the greatest challenge is, of course, the implementation of putting these things into practice and making sure that those in country uh, are continually refreshed and have an understanding of the choices they make and why they do what they do. So this is my last slide, and uh, this concerns all those individuals who have been involved in many of the documents and the reference guides uh, that I've made reference to. And I'm always a little nervous when I do these kind of charts because there's always somebody perhaps that I might have uh, forgotten, so my apologies if I've neglected to list you but to just stand here before you and, and acknowledge all those who contributed to the range of materials that I've just referenced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana, for the presentation. You want to read and you watch. So I already personally have started watching the video. So now, uh, my That should be centered on the screen. That's fine. We'll go ahead. All right. Am I on? Okay, good. So, this morning for system design, I'm going to talk about uh, beer and the second law of thermodynamics and the fictional country of East Leidenlandia. So, all of that somehow is going to work into immunization supply chain as it applies to system design. So for system design, there's a, a lot of there's been a lot of discussion about system design, and it's been both in uh, the call to action that Robert presented uh, last night. Yeah, woven into that story is looking at your supply chain in a system uh, dynamics approach. Also in the, the Gates Foundation, when Roger spoke last night, he, he mentioned system design, and then uh, later this week uh, on the, the Gavi supply chain strategy as well as the the hub. Uh, WHO UNICEF Hub Supply Chain Strategy. An integral part of that is also system design. And so there's a, a working group uh, that we put together as part of this Gavi Supply Chain Strategy to talk about how we can use system design uh, approaches in immunization supply chains. And so, so the different groups have been brought together to work on system design in this working group. It's a, it's a nice mix of implementing partners, foundations, agencies, 
uh, uh, members of the private sector, uh, consulting groups, people that know about different stages of system design, whether it's in the implementation, whether it's in developing a strategy, uh, whether it's in measuring its effectiveness, and we're putting together uh, information to help countries be in a better position to implement these kinds of solutions. So, why system design? So, the top, the top left, anyone played the, the beer game for supply chain? Some have, some have. It's a great example, it's a great tool to use for understanding the impacts of uh, low, little communication or little visibility to information and how it has a ripple effect in your supply chain. It's also called the bullwhip effect. Uh, it was defined as the bullwhip effect by the man in the middle, the middle there, it's Hal Lee from Stanford. But I'm not going to talk about the beer game other than just to promote it. It's, it's a fun team building exercise as well. But he, he also has written about system dynamics in, in system designs. And here he was talking about the private sector, but it, it applies nonetheless. And it said supply chains and companies, they don't stick to the same supply networks. Uh, when markets or strategies, the environment with which they operate, when those things change. Instead, the supply chains need to keep adapting and adjusting to those changing needs. And that's difficult, but it's a, it's a critical process to be able to grow and, and still deliver. And so this is similar also then to the second law of thermodynamics, and that entropy is always increasing. Right? And so it takes work and effort to be able to manage that entropy. And, and that's really the environment we live in. And so if we look at the SAGE presentation, I'm not going to, to go through these again because you've seen them, we definitely live in a, in a changing world with immunizations. So it's not only new, new products that we have to deal with and new challenges, but there's also new technologies and new research that can be applied, which means new opportunities available uh, in our supply chains. So, so this may be what you have expected me to talk about, because these are some things that are on the agenda today. So you know, maybe it's changing your network design, the number of levels, or changing your inventory policies, how much safety stock you hold in different parts of the supply chain, integration of products, segmentation strategies. But this isn't system design itself. These are elements of system design. And they're important elements, but it's not these specific projects that make up a system design approach. Instead, I look at each of these things as the single vaccine. These are like the single bit of medicine that can be used, but there, it's not the whole system. What you need from that single vaccine is a full immunization strategy, like what has been developed in, in Nigeria with routine immunization strategy. So that then is part of system design. And so we, we don't talk about it in terms of the network or even optimization. It's more about a, a continuous process. We are con can continually uh, re-emphasizing uh, the problems, root cause analysis, and looking for paths forward. So it's strategic and forward-looking. It's not just looking at an assessment of the way things exist today, but also considering what changes you may have to expect in the future. It's informed, meaning you're using information from the system to inform your future decisions. Uh, and it's a continuous process. So how can we help? So what this working group is trying to define is a toolkit. And before you think uh, a toolkit, it's, it's not just uh, a toolkit that sits on a shelf. This is what we see as, a, as an evolving toolkit. And a lot of these things already exist today from a number of people that, that are in this room uh, today. But it's country engagement. We want to make sure that there are mechanisms in place that, that this information can be applied in, in the country. So whether it's through uh, an EBM implement, uh, improvement planning process, or through a CMYP, or uh, emergency response planning. There's a lot of different catalytic events that can be taking place where you can in, in put in, in, into practice the systems design approach. It's uh, guidance materials. So how do you go about a, a project of defining the problems, measuring the outcomes? Uh, evidence, looking at different approaches that have been used by other countries, what has worked? Why did it work in those, in those scenarios? Who needed to be involved? Uh, and it's tools, and it's not just the hammers that are tools, but it's also the gloves that allow you to use the hammers in those tools. So it's tools that help you assess your supply chain, help you ask questions, learn more information, as well as to be able to simulate the effects of uh, future, um, future engagements in your supply chain. All right, so how would this look in practice? So this is 
uh, East Lydolandia. And so we're going to look at is this, you know, a couple of years to take place in this fictional country. And there's probably no way that you can read those tiny little words. But what's happening is it's coming out of an EVM process. It's recognized that some districts in the southern region are performing as well as other districts. And through a root cause analysis, they find that you know it's uh, visibility that because of lack of visibility, there's inventory imbalances. And so for those regions, it's kind of a less equitable system. And so they put into place a data management strategy to improve their visibility, as well as recognizing that what, you know, the type of transportation they have from the central level down to the districts doesn't mean, need to be the same district level. So they could you know, use a, a separate district to district inventory imbal imbalance kind of machine to help uh, with the inventory imbalances. So, so that is put into place. So a year later, however, it's determined that uh, because of the data dashboard, because of the indicators that have been put into place, Without having another assessment, they recognize that there are equipment failures in one region. So even though they, this wasn't identified in the EVM process, it's still something that comes out of uh, managing the data actively. So the root cause analysis turns out to be a maintenance problem with cold chain equipment. And so through the model they had built originally as part of the EVM, they worked with their national logistics working group as part of this system strategy. And they, they place on top of the district to district level transportation a maintenance function as well. So we jump uh, a couple of years in advance. The next time they run their EVM, they're expecting all good news. But what happens? Uh, now their storage scores are really good, their transportation scores are really good. Um, but now their vaccine management and district, distribution scores are much lower. So how could this have happened if they put all this effort and work? Well, what's happened is the environment around them has changed. So they've introduced a new vaccine, they put more stress onto the human resource capabilities, new people needed to be trained, and so they're not reacting as well uh, from, a, from a, a capability standpoint. And the lower level distribution could keep up as well with the, with the new inventory. And so they needed to come back, uh, consider a new staff training plan, and uh, new transportation indicators that weren't part of the original dashboard to help them be on top of this on a uh, quarterly, monthly, or annual basis instead of the uh, next EVM assessment. Okay, so that's just one, one example of this continuous approach look at system design. So moving forward, so what does this mean for you? So first, uh, this isn't new. This is happening uh, right now. And there's a lot of examples that we've chosen to be presented today as part of the, um, the agenda so that you can see some examples of this. Second, uh, the idea is we want to see this toolkit being used to put programs in a better position to adopt a continuous improvement approach. So it's access to, to the tools and the evidence to be able to put this into practice. Third, there's many opportunities to engage. So there's a lot of groups within the working group that are already working as partners in your country. And so by engaging, it's not that you're engaging with this gigantic working group and all of a sudden, you know, 15 people from 10 different agencies show up. We're saying you can work individually with different agencies and we all as part of this working group want to see this succeed. We want to see more, uh, we want to see you know, more recommendations from a systems design uh, approach. We want to see more implementations based on those recommendations and we want to see better outcomes based on the more flexible and responsive supply chain. Uh, so fourth, there's many partners behind this. Uh, and we do have, uh, we created this uh, email if you'd like to give us feedback uh, as we're building out the, this toolkit or give us more information uh, or want to learn more about how you can engage in, in the system design type of uh, projects, feel free to email us at ISC System Design and uh, we'll, we'll work with you. Thank you.
So, Ruth, uh, we talked uh, about uh, the network optimization and modeling to prepare for new vaccine introduction in the modern world.
looked at the, the, the graphs here with our PCG, uh, that have uh, stopped at around 80% and it goes up a little bit to 90. Uh, but from between 2000 and 2011, we sort of like, uh, uh, sort of like at the same place in terms of coverage. And DPT3, uh, same thing, uh, stagnated at uh, 70 uh, to 75 uh, percent. So what we're having here is a, is a system uh, that is stagnated and therefore uh, we're not improving our coverage. Um, the system has a frequent stock, stock out and this is what is uh, uh, affecting coverage. Uh, let me tell you a bit about the system. The system is uh, multi-tier and it places management requirements uh, at the level of the, uh, at the different levels. So it follows the administrative systems of a decentralized uh, uh, administrative system. So we have the national level uh, and the provincial level and the district level and then we have the capacity. Uh, each level has uh, responsibilities and a lot of responsibility is uh, placed at the district level where there are very few resources. And, and so uh, it starts falling apart from there when the districts are supposed to take vaccines uh, and distribute them to the health facilities. Uh, on top of that, uh, on a system that is not uh, functioning very well already, we are this year introducing a lot of vaccines in Mozambique, new vaccines which is something that's also happening in other countries. Uh, in Mozambique, we are going to be introducing in the last half of uh, 2015, um, IPD uh, rotavirus and uh, uh, measles second dose. And uh, on top of the fact that we are also um, a having a demonstration in some few districts of it. So this is going to put a lot of weight uh, onto a system uh, that's already having uh, uh, fault. On the other hand, the new approaches and technologies that are that, that are you know showing up uh, that can introduce efficiencies uh, to this uh, system. And so Mozambique is also uh, hearing and being exposed uh, through partnership with the uh, the main partners and NGOs that are in the country. And so the the, the Ministry of Health is uh, uh, being exposed and, uh, to these systems that can help improve uh, these approaches that can help improve the system. So all of these things that I just said in the uh, previous slide, um, uh, the system that is not functioning very well already and uh, the introductions of new vaccines has put a, a certain level of agency to Mozambique uh, to uh, try some of these approaches uh, that are being uh, put forward and uh, to try and, and find efficiencies in the system. So uh, HEMIS uh, modeling is one of these uh, uh, initiatives and uh, an approach uh, that has been brought into Mozambique. And it is a, a, it is a system that can, it is a tool, modeling, uh, HEMIS modeling is a tool that can demonstrate changes to supply chain uh, to find efficiencies in the system and improve uh, uh, performance. Uh, the results uh, of uh, the modeling exercise uh, will give us uh, information on uh, availability of uh, vaccines at the health facility level uh, as well as the cost uh, per dose administered. And you can compare across different scenarios, and so you're able to uh, virtually pilot uh, um, uh, different uh, models uh, of uh, the system uh, using this tool, and be able to see what it could cost you. So it's, it's uh, uh, basically a, a tool that helps you to say, what if I did this, and what if I did that, and you're able to uh, work that out and see uh, what that would cost you, and uh, how much uh, vaccine you would have available, available at the health facility chose to use that model. Uh, so when, when uh, um, the HAMS modeling tool was introduced in Mozambique, uh, it was like something like uh, in Mozambique you say it's an uh, uh, issue uh, of second passage, meaning that it is uh, a, a, a piece with seven heads. 
something that you know is something like very complicated, very complex, something that you know is brought by some computer geeks that are sitting in Pittsburgh University, USA, and it was like, okay, uh, well, you know, it's too difficult to understand, and uh, we, we couldn't imagine uh, what it's like to use this tool as, as, a, as, a, as a government and as an API team. So it was important uh, to try to find ways of demystifying this and, and simplifying it and bringing it uh, to be something that uh, the country can see as a tool uh, that is useful. So we created a, a local team of experts made out of Mozambicans uh, that could learn uh, through the process uh, of uh, modeling and be able to use the tool to uh, uh, test different models and interpret results, uh, which would then lead to uh, decisions uh, that are informed uh, by evidence coming out from the modeling exercise. So uh, modeling considered different uh, uh, supply chains that it was piloted in, in two provinces, I should say, uh, because in the beginning, like I say, it was something that the country had never heard of and they didn't know what uh, kind of results we're going to get, and uh, so there was reluctance in, uh, in, in uh, putting resources into that uh, system and doing it countrywide uh, before we know what exactly this, this tool can help us with. And so uh, the country decided to pilot in two provinces, uh, one in the south of the country and one in the north. So uh, those two provinces, uh, we modeled the, um, the multi-tiered system, it into uh, the system, I mean into the, into the tool, and this is a system that follows the administrative uh, uh, levels as I explained earlier. We also modeled the streamlined system using transport loops uh, from province level, direct to health facilities, that skips uh, uh, the provinces, uh, I mean that skips the district and the storage unit. So that uh, those are loops that uh, link the provinces direct and do distributions uh, at the health facility and uh, come back uh, uh, to the province, uh, leave some uh, uh, buffer stock at the, at the district uh, store, but uh, the, the, dis the district is not a, 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 a warehousing uh, a place and it does not have the responsibility for uh, distribution in this uh, model. So there were also variables of delivery intervals that we also uh, tried, uh, we modeled, for example, we modeled what it would be like uh, to do uh, deliveries instead of uh, uh, once a month, perhaps uh, every six weeks, or perhaps every two months in uh, the areas that we had to reach, uh, like uh, one of the, uh, the provinces that we pilot in the south has a, has a the north part of that uh, province is very difficult to reach. Uh, then we also did uh, national uh, to province level um, because the country was very very worried and we quickly wanted to find out uh, how to uh, resolve the issue of moving vaccines from the south to the north of the country. Those who know Mozambique is a very long country, uh, so Maputo is down in the south and, and then the north is, is just up there, you know, we're low, almost like in Tanzania when we're in the north. And so, Moving things between the south and north is, is a very uh, is not a very easy thing um, in Mozambique. So we looked at uh, how can the, 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 the distribution to the provincial level uh, can be done, and uh, we we put up a model that was using uh, whole trucks uh, to deliver to all the provinces. This was compared with a model where uh, the vaccines are also sent uh, by plane to the north and central region. So this is what uh, we found um, in, in Pabdogado province. Uh, we found uh, that uh, these efficiencies, as you can see, um, in Pabdogado, uh, the, 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 the model uh, uh, multi-tiered uh, uh, model was having a 76% uh, availability of vaccines at a cost of 38 cents uh, uh, per dose at this time, when the streamlined uh, was uh, uh, costing uh, 23 uh, cents at 92% uh, uh, availability at the health facility. So in, in Gaza as well, uh, which was the, the, the province of the south, had uh, similar results as you can see, and uh, in, in more efficiencies were found 
in the streamlined delivery system. So at the national level, we found that uh, using the trucks uh, to deliver and not using the airplane uh, was more of an efficient uh, system. So uh, when you, uh, uh, you are doing modeling, uh, you have to consider other uh, criteria. It's not just what comes out of the computer, uh, then people have to sit and look at it, because a model can look uh, beautiful coming out of the computer, but then it's, uh, it, it gets tested through whether there's human resources, resource capacity, whether there's transport availability, or availability of funds and uh, political will and, and physical feasibility of uh, transport to reaching those places. All those things are very important uh, to consider in order to eventually pass the model as uh, one that is uh, implementable. So uh, at the end of it, um, uh, the decision in Gaza made by the provincial government is that it is possible to reach the entire province using a streamlined approach with transport routes for monthly deliveries in the south and a two-month delivery schedule for the northern region. But extra care will be provided uh, to, with the remote temperature monitoring devices to ensure cold chain equipment uh, performance. Uh, and this is a, something, uh, a decision, informed decision. That means, you know, in, uh, normal practice of delivery once a month, they, they found that it was not efficient uh, in terms of cost and availability, but uh, uh, the other, uh, uh, the streamlined one, uh, not streamlined, but rather uh, delivering it uh, uh, two months intervals in the north where it's very difficult to reach and, and also the, the health and districts are sparsely and it's very costly, uh, was uh, uh, better to every two months and at national level again uh, as I said the contracts were chosen. So now at this uh, in Mozambique we are at the stage where during December uh, 2014 uh, the, the EPI national meeting uh, it was decided that the, the outcomes of uh, this uh, modeling were very positive and very useful to, to bring the evidence that the country needs to make decisions and it should be decided uh, that a national level of modeling uh, end to end uh, of the uh, supply chain uh, should be done uh, throughout the country and so now we are in that process of doing that. Thank you.
and the modality is collection or recovery. We are also to minimize this uh, low metal system and also to uh, minimize the destruction and the issue the regular availability. The list of games of Ethiopia decided to give the responsibility to the uh, FSA in 2013. The responsibility shifted from the uh, federal disturbance system to the FSA in 2013. So, based on the proposal, the uh, FSA proposed uh, Machine transition to manage in the phase based uh, approach. Uh, as I said to you before, we are certain paths. So, the first phase one, the sites are Makale Hub uh, and uh, also the Barra in the Juma Hub. Uh, and the next aim has been completed. So, we uh, we did the distribution analysis in the Makale Hub and we tried to answer these three key questions from this distribution analysis. Uh, the first uh, uh, question we tried to answer is does, have, you know, does the Makale Hub have enough transport resources to provide direct delivery from the FSA Makale Hub to 40 plus or so districts? And are there other constraints that we have about? have as a reliability to move to the direct delivery to the resource to work us. And what frequency of delivery is possible monthly or uh, by monthly. So to answer this question we use uh, Lama source supply chain guru to conduct the transportation analysis. And from this analysis we try to answer or to assess the number and the size of vehicles needed and the possible distribution rules as well as storage capacity in the area. And this is the Makale Hub uh, size map. The one in red, in red is the uh, Makale Hub, and the one in the blue is the uh, Waragas or Mystery. Makale Hub is the survey. So Makale Hub is uh, around 5 million population, and uh, we find Makale Hub in the northern part of the country. The data on the information we use are uh, volume of vaccines and <coughs> the commodities that we are going to distribute to the orders, location or GPS of the hub, as well as the order of the history sites, called the uh, uh, storage capacity at the previous level, as well as the order level, and also digital coordinator, number of neighbors, and also loading and travel times, maximum length of routes, and so these are the information we are using. The and uh, for the sake of uh, this, uh, uh, this group, I'm not going uh, directly to how the supply chain group is working, but um, I will focus on the findings. After we analyze the uh, data, our findings are uh, as follows. The number of vehicles we need in this distribution uh, direct delivery for monthly basis, we need two refrigerated vehicles and five. Uh, as well as the total distances, we covered about uh, 4,500 kilometers to deliver direct delivery to Waradas. And the time needed in days is around 20 days. The average volume per route is 1.5 meter cube. And the average Waradas capacity, so the cold store capacity utilized if we deliver monthly is around 72 percent. We use 72 percent of the storage capacity. So based on our finding, we found this route map, and it's five route maps, the four are similar, and the one in the northern west part of the Tigray, with uh, the longer of the route map, is the uh, less stock time. So the storage capacity of the red level looks like this. The one in black, sorry, the one in black is, uh, uh, is the capacity of the red level, uh, uh, capacity of the red level, and the one in blue implementation or the capacity value if we deliver monthly. So from this analysis uh, we learned that with current resources from both the FSA and the Kaliha side and from the Varada side, monthly direct delivery to all Varadas is possible. But by monthly delivery in some cases there is a pressure of the strain 
all the more than storage capacity of the Kali app. So yeah. when you are delivering your bimensity, you can do it from the FSA side, FSA the Kali side, but the other does it have some pressure. So how moving forward, more than the delivery becoming faster for all of But our previous transition plans, the plan was to deliver to all the stones as intermediate storage levels in our contexts. And so we shift from zonal delivery to the delivery. We try to do also some sensitivity analysis regarding adjusting the storage time. The market travel speed as well as increasing the volume of the And uh, when you are adjusting time from 45 to 90 minutes, 45 minutes to 60 minutes, uh, all the remains are completed and the route will not be changed. But um, when we shift the stopping time to 90 minutes, it will add one small route. Uh, when uh, we are doing the sensitivity analysis on running with uh, travel speed, when you are reducing the travel speed by 10%, uh, the route is not changed. When you are reducing the, the travel speed by 20%, it will add one small road. Uh, increasing the volume estimate, when we are increasing our volume estimate by 20%, and by 100%, the route is big in half. So the overall finding is no significant impact in this uh, description analysis and the description analysis. And also additional analysis after we answering the first three questions, uh, we try to answer also this additional question regarding the campaign. And uh, we found that folio campaign to be distributed together with the roots for the transportation and availability. So uh, it will not be distributed separately. So we deploy another vehicle from the center or from uh, another hub. Uh, and so there is a newly operationalized hub that is the Shere Hub, is located in the same region. So Shere Hub will be operationalized after a few months. So we found that it will uh, increase our storage capacity and also we will use uh, our resource wisely when the Shere Hub will be operationalized. Finally, also we need to do some further analysis. Uh, for example, there are the specific constraints, like some districts of Waragas are off road, and also it's not easy to accessible by refrigerated trucks or vehicles, so we need to do some further analysis regarding this. And also, in the next months, we are going to do the, some posting analysis for phase uh, one pass, and also for the uh, central. And, uh, and also, as I told you before, the first uh, transition of the uh, hub and also Makata and Jaset. So uh, we are doing uh, further analysis of so we collect the data and we analyze all Makata and also uh, Jiva for the uh, control. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And this uh, work is funded by the Indian Foundation. And also I'd like to say thank you for the uh, BPC Central and also uh, BPC Makale as well as Federal Minister of Health. And we're going to have a video. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have not shown you even the red card. Thank you for your time. So now I invite uh, my old friend, Philip Jaya, to come and tell us uh, how we can be in the redesign of the uh, supply chain. Uh, the process we took to have the vaccines to the last mile. Good morning to all. Uh, I'm happy to present the story. It's going to be fast for <laughs> So I'm happy to present the, the work done in Benin for the strengthening of the, of the vaccine supply chain. Uh, this work started in, in uh, 2012 when the Ministry of Health faced challenges in introducing new vaccines and deciding to improve the immunization supply chain. 
following assessments and planning activities, uh, MOH with partner support identify strategic direction for an efficient supply chain. Uh, a pilot optimized supply chain was implemented in one district to prepare for the national level. So um, I will first uh, show a, a video uh, which will uh, present an overview of the uh, origin of the, of the initiative and the pilot implementation. Uh, afterwards, I will come back to the decision and implementation process uh, and present some results of the pilot implementation evaluation. And uh, finally, I will present uh, the plan for the deployment of the system uh, countrywide and uh, conclusion. Vaccination is one of the most effective public health interventions in protecting and improving the health of populations. However, for quality vaccines to be available in health facilities in the right quantity at the right time and to all in the right conditions, the existence of an efficient logistics system is essential. In Benin, a review of the National Organization Program reveals shortcomings in the vaccine and consumers' supply chain, delaying the introduction of new vaccines and hindering the improvement of immunization coverage. Vaccines are stored in the national warehouse. Vaccines are transported by refrigerated trucks to the departmental warehouse where they are kept in cold rooms or refrigerators. In Benin, in the conventional supply chain, the municipal level comes after the departmental level. Heads of municipal warehouses travel with insulated boxes to the departmental level to procure vaccines and consumables. In municipal warehouses, vaccines are stored in refrigerators. In this system, each municipal warehouse uses a vehicle. EPI miners from each facility visit municipal warehouses by motorbike with vaccine carriers. Once there, they get vaccines and equipment needed for injections based on their needs. Nous nous sommes rendus compte à l'évaluation de la gestion efficace des vaccins que notre pays était confronté à plusieurs dysfonctionnements. Dysfonctionnements notamment par rapport à la gestion de la température, par rapport à la capacité de stockage et également par rapport à la maintenance des infrastructures. Quand on s'intéresse à la distribution, Nous nous rendons compte qu'il y avait un problème de distribution des vaccins tout au long de la pyramide sanitaire. Health workers in charge of logistics functions do not have sufficient expertise in this specialized field and are taken away from their primary role, which is patient care. To overcome the numerous shortcomings that slow down the system and negatively impact immunization coverage, the Nimes Ministry of Health asked partners to help improve the system and, in turn, immunization service performance. L'ANT a pu réaliser des évaluations qualitatives et quantitatives et utiliser un outil de modélisation, Hermès, développé par le Vaccine Mobility Institute, qui ont permis de mieux spécifier les difficultés du programme de vaccination et de son système logistique et qui ont permis aussi de définir un système optimal euh, qui permettrait d'assurer une meilleure disponibilité des vaccins aux endroits où on en a besoin, c'est-à-dire jusqu'aux endroits les plus reculés du pays, et à moins de coût. À la fin de l'évaluation, le ministre de la Santé de Benin a identifié 
for strategic directions to enhance the performance of the vaccine supply chain. Il fallait procéder à l'acquisition de, de chaînes de foie exclusivement adaptées à l'énergie solaire. Il fallait procéder à la professionnalisation des acteurs qui assurent la gestion de la chaîne logistique et aussi penser à l'intégration au niveau des zones sanitaires de l'approvisionnement en produits de vaccination. In the new procurement and vaccine distribution system, several municipal warehouses are replaced by a single health zone warehouse with an equipped vehicle called the mobile warehouse. The health zone distribution goes to the department warehouse to procure vaccines in zones. At health zone level, vaccines are kept in refrigerators and managed by a computerized system. Each month, the health zone logistician serves each health facility in his or her zone. He or she controls the quality of vaccines, keeps track of the temperature, maintains refrigerators, monitors vaccine in consumer stock levels, and resupplies them as needed. The COE health zone was identified by the Ministry of Health to implement, on a pilot basis, activities aimed at the reorganization of the immunization supply chain. The goal was to apply all the strategic directions in this area and to evaluate them before extending the system to the rest of the country. The orientation strategic was to make the sanitaire zone sanitary level the last level of distribution and so to supprime the level of commune so that the system of distribution of vaccines was identical to the pyramid sanitary of the country and the sanitary zone has benefited from the important de réfrigérateurs solaires et euh, notre peau euh, du nouveau zone sanitaire a été complètement aménagée. Tout au long de notre intervention, nous avons également donné des formations sur les bases de la gestion efficace des vaccins sur la logistique de santé. Une autre des orientations stratégiques définies par le ministère était la professionnalisation du métier de logisticien. The logistician travels through the 38 health centers in the health zone of the Mobile Warehouse in order to deliver vaccines in real time while undertaking the maintenance of equipment of the new solar coal chain. This reorganization of the vaccine supply chain in COVID has a positive impact on the performance of the immunization system. Donc, au total, les bénéfices sont énormes. Comme Maou, nos quatre communes se déplaçaient pour aller à l'eau, pour aller chercher les vaccins. On mobilise un véhicule, on mobilise le café, on mobilise le chauffeur, on doit payer tout ça. C'est le plus ça maintenant. Donc, c'est un seul véhicule pour toute la zone sanitaire avec un chauffeur et puis le responsable de cela qui se déplace pour aller chercher les vaccins et qui fait la distribution de formation sanitaire par formation sanitaire. Et les formations sanitaires, au lieu, se dé... au lieu que les erreurs se déplacent, laissent la impact à leurs occupations habituelles. Nous avons alors l'efficacité à votre goût. Vraiment, c'est une nouvelle. La perspective au niveau national, c'est qu'après l'évaluation qui est faite au niveau de COVID, c'est de tirer les bonnes parties et de les distribuer au niveau national. Et nous voulons saluer ce partenariat que nous avons eu avec l'AFP qui nous a permis d'arriver à ce résultat. Logistic improvements. 
especially to uh, cope with the new vaccine introduction. Uh, there was uh, then a discussion and a, a choice of the, of the method to be implemented, to be used for, for, the, for this uh, system improvement. Um, and so we agreed to have both a qualitative assessment, a quantitative assessment with a, a cold chain equipment inventory or uh, update of the former cold chain equipment inventory and EBM assessment. And we collected uh, additional uh, data from the logistics system. Uh, and there was also transport management evaluation. Uh, then, uh, during a national workshop, uh, results from this uh, assessment were, were presented. And there was a um, decision, or there was identification of four alternative um, supply chain models uh, that were modelized, modeled by the MS tool, uh, and the presentation of the result from the from the MS tool showed the availability of vaccines and the costs of four the four different systems that were identified. Uh, Help the Minister of Health to decide for one of the of the model, uh, plus some additional uh, uh, component of this uh, new system. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a decision also to have some distribution loops, uh, saying that uh, only changing the level of distribution will not affect much, but having this uh, change of level plus distribution loop will have a, uh, will should have a real uh, effect on the efficiency of the, of the system distribution. Also, there was a decision to switch uh, from uh, so to solar cold chain. Kerosene and fridges to solar cold chain, and also to go for the professionalization of the supply chain management. This took uh, nine months uh, just to have this decision and plan. And another year uh, to, to have the system implemented. So this part, this is to show you the work that has been done at the district level. Uh, and with uh, an, another in-depth analysis to make sure that uh, uh, everything will be set up at the district level uh, with the designation of human resource uh, loops and uh, identification of the cold chain equipment structures to be uh, replaced. The, the system started in January 14 uh, and there was an evaluation conducted by UNICEF after eight months. This is some uh, results, a summary of the results from the evaluation and the monthly monitoring. So we, you, you can see in the EBM assessment, there was three EBM assessments conducted. One in 2012, another one uh, after two years, uh, and after eight months uh, for the system to be implemented. And uh, another EBM assessment in a control district. Uh, so you can see that there are some, some good improvements some criteria, not all, uh, but mostly for the distribution, the vaccine management because of the training that was implemented, uh, and infrastructure storage capacity. Uh, there was also some other uh, very interesting results from the quality of the vaccines. Uh, since during the, the visit, the logistician was able to have a real check on what is within in, in the fridges and uh, was able to remove some uh, uh, vaccines that were with the uh, uh, um, And at the end, there was also an uh, uh, inclusion of the, the, all this system, the running cost of the system within the, uh, the annual plan for the, for the district action plan. Uh, not everything was good, and uh, there was there is still some uh, problem. And after a few months, there was still some problem with the, uh, the stock levels, uh, which uh, show and this, this graph show that uh, uh, there are well, there's still discussion of out of the, of the minimum and maximum stock levels uh, for most of the vaccines. Um, and at the end, there is. There is uh, 
no improvement in vaccine coverage during that period, which may be uh, due to uh, other factors like uh, drop off, uh, uh, outreach session, and uh, strike at the national level. Um, so, next phase, uh, next step will be extension, as uh, it was said in the video. So, uh, we are now planning with the Ministry of Health to have an extension countrywide of the, of the system. Um, to ensure that there will be vaccine availability in all uh, uh, 34 health zones or districts. Uh, and also uh, we expect to have a reduction of the, of the logistic costs of the organization. And so this is a list of activities. Maybe I, I won't go through this one and uh, you will have uh, able to, to read it and or see it later on. As a conclusion, uh, well, maybe we can say that this system was a uh, more uh, a very good experience to focus on the uh, immunization logistics um, and a uh, good opportunity to improve the vaccine management and raise uh, stakeholders' attention at national level and from level. Uh, we also uh, understood that it's really important to have a country uh, decision for, for come to, to start with uh, this kind of work since uh, it's required a lot of changes at different level. Um, there is a, a need of technical assistance uh, to, link, to link between the technical, the managerial and the political components at all levels, especially at the central level, which was very important to have all this uh, uh, well, this buy-in from the Ministry of Health and different departments of the Ministry of Health, but also from the, uh, the local partners. We also saw that uh, monitoring and supervision are essential to maximize the benefits of the system. Uh, and especially uh, while at all level, uh, and we saw that uh, even though the logistician was trained, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that it can really uh, maximize this, uh, the activities it's uh, doing and all this investment that was done. Uh, role and responsibilities uh, should be carefully agreed uh, by, at all level uh, to, to manage this task shifting. Because it's, well, some people were responsible for, for vaccine distribution at different level who lose these responsibilities and got some uh, frustration. There was some uh, uh, side effects, you can say, from, from this uh, model. Uh, but uh, so we, we have to make sure that everyone is clearly understanding its responsibilities, roles, and uh, that uh, there is a, a clear chain of comment for, for this uh, new system. Um, also, uh, another uh, thing that we, we learned from, from this system is uh, that the, the, this immunization supply chain, especially at the service level or mid-level, can, cannot belong to the immunization program, but not more to the, the health system at that level. So it's really important to have uh, this uh, perspective of not only uh, working with the EPI, but uh, the whole system and that's all. So I have two things. Uh, just to, to uh, this slide to show you the number of partners that were involved in this uh, in this project uh, and who will continue to work for the, for the development of the of this system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jefferson Lassat from GSI will handle for 15 minutes the q &A. I was just going to say, I have the unenviable task of trying to manage 250 of you asking questions in only 15 minutes. So we should um, Two things I wanted to point out. You heard um, in two cases about the Hermes modeling and in one case about the Lamasov modeling. Today at 2 o'clock, there's a session where those two will be presenting more about those. So countries who are interested in learning more about modeling, they will be going on this afternoon. Um, 
And so now for questions, um, please, if you would, address questions to Philippe, to Ruth, or to Hennep. Um, and we encourage country reps who are sort of curious about modeling, interested in modeling in other countries, to please um, stand up and ask questions. There are eight microphones. Um, I will take whoever gets there first as the first question. Folks, wake up. I know you haven't had coffee yet, but. Can we have the light, please? So, the glass has just come up, but please, if you want to ask a question, stand up beside one of the microphones and I'll get you after Raj. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I thought the, what was that mean? of what I call, for lack of a better term, system redesign. We have, you know, that Philippe's data was really good, baseline and endline data demonstrating improvements in almost all the supply chain categories using the EVMs. And I think that's something to say about the EVM. And in Mozambique, although um, uh, we didn't see it, there's similar data using a different methodology. And so my question is, how can we use that then to begin making the case for this good work and expanding it, not only perhaps in other countries, uh, but in Benin, for example, expanding it beyond the one zone to the rest of the country. And I would, I would say for the same question with, with Mozambique. Other questions? My folks. Just thank you so much for the and I've never heard a presentation there, sometimes there's special which I'm giving, maybe next time it's better to consider that we have a few presentations instead of five, so I have two questions to Mozambique. Uh, how is the private sector engagement in terms of really making it happen instead of always we are looking to the government sector to take over? So maybe is it the way forward? Outsourcing government in terms of. On Ethiopia side, maybe just one quick question with that. We have seen now segmentation within the PFS which we have presented how. What is the integration component? The drug and the vaccine also within the Tigray hub. Is that working or all you are talking about vaccine? Thank you so much. One more question and then we'll pause for answers. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to ask uh, uh, a simple question. I uh, realize that the, the immunization systems are quite dynamic. Um, and, and, and my background is uh, contraceptive logistics and pharmaceutical logistics, but uh, we don't see that kind of dynamism in, 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 in uh, contraceptive logistics. So in immunization systems, we can find uh, quite often changes in the, in the, in the logistic system. I mean, there is always a, 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 a supplementary immunization activity. Sometimes it's expected, sometimes it's not planned. And, and vial size are changing uh, just because of the, the, the market changes. So how do you uh, keep the, 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 the model uh, going on properly? Uh, although you have lots of changes in the system, do you have to repeat this handless modeling or whatever modeling system you are using? Every year, or whenever you have a change in the system. Thank you. such thinking to take place. Is the 
costs time, it takes money, uh, it takes energy, and it takes insight. And, and so what incentives uh, were put in place or how was that sort of uh, brought to the fore to, to really undertake this? So the integration is in the 
money and labor, but in terms of distribution. And also this uh, activity in, in the new part state, we start distribution now. So we are not also distributing these other key food items, but we don't within the state, they part with other things. So we distribute parcels and separately. We are required to change the payments in all the other parts. So at this time, we Incentive for the initiative to, uh, that, to, to take place in Benin. I think uh, the first one was uh, that uh, there was several uh, assessments uh, showing that the immunization supply chain was really weak and uh, was not able to to support new vaccine introduction. And even for the for the existing vaccines, there was a lot of problems. So uh, the Minister of Health had the had, uh, uh, took this decision to, to, to improve uh, without uh, maybe uh, having a clear view on what could be possible except having the, the same uh, adding fridges or you know, was it the, the same things. Uh, and also there was uh, an opportunity in Benin uh, to have uh, uh, an agency there, a partner who was able to mobilize technical and financial resources. Uh, and this was, I think, uh, this helped a lot uh, to make the case at the highest level uh, in the Benin Ministry of Health. Uh, and since uh, the first uh, round of assessment and workshops, there was a decision taken to have it countrywide, not only for one province or one department. Uh, so to have it countrywide with a, a demonstration in one district sure that uh, the model will be uh, efficient and to improve it um, for to make it ready for, for the deployment. Uh, maybe to, to respond to Ahmed's uh, uh, question, I think uh, there, there is a need to periodically uh, revise this system and uh, I think it could be possible with the use of the uh, well, assessment of course and uh, the use of the the modeling, uh, the, the software that uh, is available, uh, country level. Uh, there, there is still a way of improvement, uh, especially uh, studying the possibility of introducing a new product within the, the, the system, uh, like another pharmaceutical product that has to be kept in the, in the, in the cold chain, or others. Um, also, they, they can still um, look at the possibility to, to have different organization in the south or the north part of the country because the, the situation is really different. So I think uh, uh, there is still need uh, of uh, having uh, a good knowledge and uh, the capacity to, to, to tailor the system coming to the well, long time and also different areas. Okay, thank you everybody. I think we are on time, so uh, I'm very happy <laughs> with all the presenters, presenters. So we are going to have uh, 20 minutes for coffee. Please come on time, so because the next one is very interesting. It's the host country. Thank